Hi there and welcome to this psychology student webinar, this one looking at the biopsychology topic localization of function. Uh, in this webinar we're going to look at three different things, so we'll start by taking a detailed look at the specification and the key definitions that you need for this part of the course. We'll then move on to the different types of questions that you could uh, that could come up in the exam here, so a label, the diagram question, short answer question, application and essay. And then in the final section we'll look at essay writing skills, in particular really in this webinar focusing on evaluation and how to build really effective evaluation from a, a smaller number of points. Okay. Let's start with the specification because the specification here, as you can see on screen, is really, really broad and therefore it's really useful to unpick the specification so that you know exactly what you need to be aware of in the exam. So our starting point here, I'm just going to highlight in yellow, are the different key terms that you need to be aware of. So localization of functions are a key term that you need to know. Hemispheric lateralization is another key term. If we go further down the uh, specification, you can also see that plasticity and functional recovery are two other key terms that you need to be aware of. On top of that though, you also need to be aware of the different areas of the brain, so the motor area, somatosensory area, auditory, visual area, and the two language centres that are named, so the Broca's area and the Wernicke's area. And then in addition to all of that, you also need to be aware of split brain research. So there's an awful lot of information that you need to know, and being able to unpick that specification and understand it is really, really important for a part of the course like this, okay? If we were to display that as a table, what you can see on screen now is that there are four key terms that you need to be aware of. So localization of function, hemispheric lateralization, plasticity and functional recovery. And then there are six brain regions that you need to know about, motor, somatosensory, visual, auditory areas, as well as those two language centers, the Broca and the Wernicke's area. And then you've got the research, the split brain research. Now that's an awful lot to pack into one webinar, so therefore what I'm going to do is actually focus on one aspect of this this evening, looking at localization of function in the brain regions, because it makes sense to put those together, and I'll come back to the other areas in a future webinar. So let's start with the definitions and start with the, the, the most important one, the umbrella term really for this part of the course, and that's localization of function. Now localization of function is the idea or the theory really that certain functions, for example things like memory and language, have certain locations within the brain. Okay, And you can see a diagram on screen that's highlighted for you now. Now the four key areas that you need to be aware of are firstly the motor area highlighted on the screen now, the somatosensory area that's also highlighted, at the back of the brain the visual area, and then last but not least the auditory area, Okay, which is actually close to where the ears are anyway. If we take each of those in turn, it's useful to also know what they do uh, and their function in particular. Okay, So the motor area is actually located in the frontal lobe of the brain and it's responsible for voluntary movements and sends signals to the muscles in the body. Now, it's particularly interesting with the motor area because the regions of the motor area okay, that span across that pink shaded area on the screen are arranged in a really, really logical order. So, for example, the region that controls your finger movements is actually located next to the region that controls your hand movements, then your arm movements and so on. So it's in a really logical order. If we take a look at the somatosensory area, uh, this area is located in the parietal lobe and receives incoming sensory information from the skin and produces different sensations like uh, the pressure that's applied, any pain, temperature and so on. And different parts of the somatosensory area receive messages from different locations in the body. Okay, And uh, I, re I read a piece of information today that said actually nearly half of the somatosensory receptors are actually in the face and the facial regions because there's so many sort of senses there. Um, Robertson, a really interesting study, found that uh, this area of the brain is, is really adaptable. Uh, and people that read brow have actually a larger area for somatosensory for their fingertips in comparison to a normal sighted person. So it shows how the, the, the structure of the area can change, which relates to the idea of plasticity that you'll come on to later. In terms of the visual area, this is located at the back of the brain in the occipital lobe and it receives and processes visual information. Uh, the visual area also contains different parts that process different types of information, including things like colour, shape and movement. And then last but not least, you've got the auditory area, which is located in the temporal lobe, and it's responsible for analysing and processing acoustic information. Now again, there's different parts to the auditory area, but one that I'm just going to draw on here, the primary auditory area, is involved in processing the simple features of sound, including how loud something is, uh, the tempo, how fast it is, and the pitch, how high or low it is. Okay. 
there you have it. So those are your four different areas that you need to be aware of. Motor area, somatosensory area, visual area and auditory area. And what's interesting about all of those areas is that they're actually located across both hemispheres. And I'll come back to that idea when we actually talk about uh, hemispheric lateralization later. On top of those four, there's two other regions, the language centres that you need to be aware of. And these include the Broca's area, which is highlighted in yellow on screen, and the Vernix area, which is highlighted in a pinky colour on screen now as well. Now, in terms of these two areas, uh, the Broca's area got its name from uh, Paul Broca, who was working with a patient called Tan. And the reason the patient was called Tan was because he could only produce this one syllable word, which was Tan, hence he got that nickname. Uh, and when Tan died, uh, Paul Broca performed a post-mortem examination on his brain and found that Tan actually had a lesion in the left frontal lobe, where it highlighted in yellow on screen, which then became known as the Broca's area. Uh, Paul Broca concluded that this area must be responsible for speech production and it was the damage in Tan's brain to this area that prevented him from being able to speak fluently. Interestingly, at roughly the similar time, around about the same time, uh, scientist Carl Bernicke discovered a group of patients who could talk but they couldn't comprehend and understand language okay and what he discovered in their brains uh, was that the left temporal lobe had uh, damage to it the area highlighted in pink on screen now which led him to conclude that this area must be responsible for understanding and comprehending language so you've got these two areas that work together one to actually produce language the Broca's area and one to understand and comprehend language the Wernicke's area so there we have it on screen. You can see all six of the different areas that you need. I've grouped them in terms of the four key areas plus the two language centres in orange. And if you're anything like me, I think it's useful to sort of display this information in a table because if you're asked a question on these, it's useful to know where they're located, what the function of them are, is, and also when it comes to a later topic, do they span across both hemispheres or are they only located in one hemisphere? And what you can see on the screen now is that you've got the motor area, which is in the frontal lobe, somatosensory in the parietal, visual area or occipital lobe, auditory area, uh, temporal lobe. Those uh, regions of the brain span across both hemispheres, whereas the Broca and the Wernicke's area are both located in the left hemisphere only. Okay, And I've just outlined the functions on there. So a really useful table for revision purposes that you might want to print off and come back to at a later date. So there we are, we've defined all the key terms. Now we move on to the different types of questions that you can get in the exam. It starts with a labelling the diagram question, a short answer question, application question and an essay question. Now I always say this when it comes to bio, but biopsychology. There's no point in looking at really complex diagrams in different textbooks that are quite intimidating when the reality is in the exam you're going to get a black and white 2D image that looks like the one on screen now and you're going to be asked to simply label it. So actually using the exam material here is really really worthwhile. Okay, If we look at region 1 hopefully you can now identify successfully that that's the motor area. If we look at region 2 down at the bottom hopefully you'll spot that that's now the auditory area. Region 3 is that specific part of the language centre, so that's the Wernicke area, which therefore means, last but not least, number 4 is our somatosensory area. Okay. The other types of questions that you can get are short answer questions, and there's a whole range of different questions you can get here. So you could get explain what is meant by the term localisation of function, you could get outline the role of the motor area in the brain, outline the role of the visual area in the brain, and so on. Um, there are no application questions in the sample assessment material, so I've just made one up for the purpose of this webinar, just to give you a flavour of what an application question could look like. So the question I've created says a neurologist found that his patient Walter was experiencing a pattern of language difficulties that he'd seen before. Walter was able to understand speech and could make the odd sound, but was unable to express any words coherently. Use your knowledge of localisation of function to explain what areas of the brain might be affected in Walter. And then last but not least, what we'll come on to in the, the final part of this webinar is that potential essay question, discuss localization of function in the brain for 16 marks, okay? Let's take a look at a couple of those short answer questions. So explain what's meant by the term localization of function. Take note of the number of marks in this case, so it's three. So if we just use my definition from earlier, so localization of function is the idea that certain functions, for example, language and memory, uh, have certain locations within the brain. We can already see that this isn't enough really to get us the full three marks on this particular question. So therefore, the key is to elaborate on this or go a step further. So what we might say is, for example, the Broca's area is said to be responsible for speech production and the Wernicke's area is said to be responsible for language comprehension. So by adding those two examples in there, we're just making sure we gain access to all of those marks available. Let's take a look at one more to outline the role of the motor area in the brain. A similar sort of idea applies here. We're going to need to expand our knowledge. So I've said the role of the motor area is to control voluntary motor movement by sending signals to the muscles in the body. Okay. 
Um, I'm going to add to this now using that table of information I presented earlier. Furthermore, the role is to control muscles on the opposite side of the body. So the left, left hemisphere controls muscle movements on the right and vice versa for the right hemisphere. You might want to go even further if you still don't think you've got enough. I'm just giving you some different ideas here. So the regions of the motor area are arranged in a logical order, as I said earlier. For example, the region that controls finger movements located next to the region that controls hand movements, arm movements, and so on. Just making sure we're picking up all of those available marks, okay? And you get the idea with the short answer questions. Let's take a look at that application question that I made up, a fairly straightforward one, and one where you can certainly use the information in the extract to answer your question, as you're going to see in a moment. So a neurologist found that his patient, Walter, was experiencing a pattern of language difficulties that he had seen before. Okay? Walter was able to understand speech and could make the odd sound, but uh, was unable to express any words coherently. Using your knowledge of localization of function, explain what areas of the brain might be affected for four marks. Now, straight away, I'd be highlighting that particular extract uh, and two different key points jump out. Firstly, he's unable to, uh, he was able to understand speech and could make the odd sound, but was unable to express any words co coherently. So we've got those two different regions. It's clearly referring to the Broca's area and the Wernicke's area for four marks. I'd start by defining one of the areas and then bringing in the, uh, the example from the extract. So I would say the Broca's area is in the left frontal lobe and is responsible uh, for speech production. As Walter can only make the odd sound and is unable to express any words, he might be suffering from damage to this region. So there we're definitely picking up at least two of the marks there, I'd hope. And then the Wernicke's area is in the left temporal lobe and is responsible for speech comprehension. Uh, as Walter is able to understand speech, it would suggest that this area is working normally. Okay, And there you can see, again, clearly answered the question, clearly referred to the extract and would pick up the marks quite comfortably there. Moving on to the final parts of the essay writing. So let's imagine uh, we ended up with an essay that says discuss localization of function in the brain for 16 marks. I always say this, but it's worth going over. The term discuss really does just mean outline and evaluate. You've got in the region of 20 to 25 minutes to write this essay, which therefore means you're looking at about the 500 words mark. Okay, Of that, I'd expect to see about 175-ish words. Uh, for your knowledge, your A1, and about 325 words for the discussion or the evaluation. Okay. Now, as I always do in these webinars, I think it's really useful to have a concrete plan in your mind about what, how you're going to actually tackle this particular essay. So for me, I'll be thinking straight away, right, what am I going to put in my knowledge for localization of function? And I would start simply by defining the term and providing the examples of the four different areas, so the visual motor areas and so on. I'd also be tempted, if I've got the words available, uh, to talk about the two language centres, the Broca's area and the Wernicke's area. And remember, the key is we're trying to achieve this in about the 175 word mark, not too many more if possible, okay? And that can be achieved, as you're about to see on screen now. So what I've said is the term localization refers to a principle uh, that specific functions originate in certain regions of the brain. Research has been carried out since the 19th century to determine the functions of these different areas of the brain. Firstly, the visual cortex lo located in the occipital lobe is responsible for processing visual information. Nerve impulses are, are transferred from the retina to the visual cortex via the optic nerves. Secondly, the auditory cortex located in the temporal lobe is responsible for auditory processing. Uh, the process starts at the cochlea, uh, which detects sound and then transports messages to the brainstem for basic processing and then on to the auditory cortex. So you can see how I've expanded that little section a, a tad more. Thirdly, the motor cortex located in the frontal lobe is responsible for coordinating movement. And finally, the somatosensory cortex in the parietal lobe processes information relating to touch, pressure, pain and temperature and so forth. OK, now that's probably already enough. There's quite a lot of words there, but I'd be tempted to go on further because we know what's in the specification. So therefore, we know that marks are going to be credited for bringing in those language centers. So other important areas of the brain are the language centers located in the left hemisphere. The Wernicke area is responsible for speech perception and the Broca area responsible for speech production. The Wernicke area receives sound impulses and processes the meaning. The messages travel to the Broca's area where sounds are assembled and then the motor cortex, which actually sends the signal to the speech muscles to produce the sound okay so a little bit more depth there but no more really than we went into earlier in this webinar so a nice outline around the 175 word mark which is exactly what we're after moving on from that we need to be aware of probably three different evaluation points that we want to use and as i said the the focus of this webinar is on extending your evaluation my first point is that there is plenty of evidence uh, to support the idea of localization that comes from case studies patient tan who i mentioned earlier uh, secondly, there's an interesting theory called the uh, equipotentiality theory, which says that higher order functions aren't actually localised and only lower order functions are. 
And then last but not least, uh, we could look at individual differences. And it's said that females actually have a larger Broca's area. Now, what's interesting is if we think back to our issues and debates webinars, which the whole series uh, are available on YouTube now, we can apply an issue and debate to each of these different areas. So if we think about case studies, that's a clear example of an ideographic approach. If we think about the fact that localization of function is a biological theory, okay, trying to reduce something down to just one biological component, we could discuss biological reductionism. And then last but not least, if we talk about individual differences being uh, not applicable to females because they're different to male brains, for example, we could talk about the issue of gender bias. So let's take each of these in turn. Let's start with the individual differences one. And I want to start by showing you what I would call a simple burger paragraph looks like, a point evidence explained paragraph to begin with. So you might say that some psychologists argue that the idea of localization fails to take into account individual differences. Go on to say, uh, Hertzi found that women uh, have proportionally larger Broca and Wernicke's areas in comparison to men, which can perhaps explain their greater ease of language uh, in, in women. Okay. We then conclude that by saying, therefore, we're unable to generalise research examining localization of function to males and females equally, as the different brain structures and sizes suggest that different considerations are required when considering the different sexes. Okay, Very good point to begin with. However, we can improve that point massively by adding in an issue in a debate. Okay, So I've kept everything the same, but all I'm going to then do is add in my issue in debate and say this, however, suggests a level of beta bias in the theory of localization of function. The differences between men and women are ignored and variations in the pattern of activation and size areas uh, observed during various language activities are not considered. Okay, So I'm literally just saying the theory has a beta bias. We weren't considering men and women equally. Okay, The rest of the points are the same, but we've improved the depth of that point, which therefore means we need less evaluation points overall. Let's take a look at the second one to give you an, a, a second example of this. It's the equipotentiality theory. Okay, uh, And we're going to bring in biological reductionism. Uh, the claim that functions are localised to certain areas of the brain has been criticised. Okay, So Lashley proposed a theory that actually said that the basic motor and sensory functions might be localised, but higher mental functions are not. And he claimed that intact areas of the cortex, so the overall brain, could take over responsibility for other functions following brain injury. And we'll come on to that in the uh, the um, a later webinar where we look at actually hemispheric lateralisation uh, and rehab of brain patients. Okay. This therefore casts doubts on theories about localization of functions, suggesting that functions are not localized to just one region, as other regions can take over the specific functions following the brain injury. Okay, Again, though, we keep everything exactly the same, but there's nothing to stop us bringing an issue and debate here. And say critics like Lashley argue that the theories of localization are biologically reductionist in nature and try to reduce very complex human behaviors and cognitive processes to one specific brain region. Such critics argue that a more thorough understanding of the brain is required to truly understand cognitive processes like language. Okay, So you get the idea, again, we've just extended that evaluation point out by adding in an issue and debate. And of course, you can come back to these slides uh, on the YouTube video later just to look over how we've extended that evaluation again. Last but not least, if I'd done that for two of them, I probably wouldn't do that for the last because I might not have the time. So I'd keep a really simple point for my final one. And I might just say that there's a wealth of case studies on patients with damage to the Broca's and Wernicke's area that demonstrate the functions of these two areas. For example, Broca's aphasia is an impaired ability to produce language in most cases, which is caused by brain damage in the Broca's area. And the same applies to Wernicke's aphasia, which is an impairment in language perception, demonstrating the importance of the role played by these two brain regions in the comprehension and the production of language. Case studies like these provide evidence to support the idea that certain elements of language production and comprehension are localised in the Broca and Wernicke regions. Okay? Now, we could, if we wanted to, bring in the idea that this is an ideographic approach to research, okay? uh, and therefore we can't generalise the results of these case studies to wider populations because these are very unique cases. Okay? But I haven't done it for this particular one, but you get the idea. So there we have it on screen. You can see my, my sort of one page plan of this particular essay, breaking it down into the localization and the language centers, my three different evaluation points, which I know how I could extend out if I wanted to. As an essay on the screen, you can see now that my A1 is my first three paragraphs there. And then I've got my three separate evaluation paragraphs in green. Brings us to a total of about 560 words, so slightly over where I'd want this to be. But we could certainly trim that down to the 500 word limit if we needed to. A very clear, well-balanced essay that should get us into that mark band four. 
Hope you found that useful. Please sign up to our future webinars by going to tutortu.net uh, forward slash psychology forward slash events. And if you've got any questions, don't hesitate to ask us via our sort of Facebook group students or via Twitter. Hope you found that useful. Thank you once again. Take care now. Bye bye.